Book Review, The Extreme Right and the Resistance, published by Louisiana State University Press, 2016. Mrs. Deacon, the author, is a nice person, gentil comme tout, and of that I am convinced. And it would not be an overstatement to say that she appears to incarnate a certain virtuousness, altruism. I would not be surprised to learn that she even goes out at nightfall to feed stray cats. Having said that, one must also add that her latest book on the extreme droite in France before and during World War II and beyond, including the Algerian War, 1954-1962, makes for less than compelling reading, striking me as a fatra, ramassi, of quotes and data that the average person would find tedious. Writing a book geared to your fellow academicians, but one that could also be enjoyed by the general public. The two are not necessarily contradictoire. One can do both, which is why my three books on the Algerian conflict, Challenging de Gaulle, Greenwood Press, 1989, Le Défi à de Gaulle, uh, Harmattin, uh, 2008, and a reprint of Challenge in Egal by Haylor Publishing have sold so well. Add to that several documentaries on my interviews with spooks and gunmen involved in the above, above mentioned Algerian conflict. I interviewed over a hundred of these those actors over a 10 year period, including some while I was at Estivan au Frais de Princesse at the Prison de Plaine for a minor offense in 1963 in order to gain a clear and dramatic picture of France's last colonial war, which Alistair Horne called the Savage War of Peace, and which resulted in metropolitan France's withdrawal from its overseas provinces and its surrender to the forces of liberation, the FLN, or Front de Libération Nationale. One wonders whether the author consulted any of the above, or the audio tapes of my interviews available at the Hoover Institution via OAC or online archives, if the author had consulted my primary sources instead of relying on secondary and tertiary ones, she would have written the General Raoul Salon, L'Oncle Raoul, to his colleagues, to his friends, had little to do with the founding of the OAS, but in fact was kidnapped by men loyal to Robert Martel, Chouan de la Mitigda, and held captive to, until the fall of 1961, when still clandestin, and sporting a mustache to avoid being recognized, returned to Algiers and hunkered down in a bourgeois neighborhood called Valentin in an Algecent. Those who founded the OAS and gave it its name were Jean-Jacques Suzini, head of Action Politique et Propaganda for the organization, and its Bête la Pensée, and Pierre Lagayard, a reserve paratrooper lieutenant who had his 15 minutes of fame when he created a redoubt during the barricades uprising to complement the bulwark of the Joseph Altise, the Monk Le Jeu, as Cézini referred to him, which was also located on the same boulevard La, La Ferrière in Algiers. Author would have known this if she had bothered to consult my documentaries and books on the subject. Thus, it is reasonable to conclude that Salon, rather than being a founder or co-founder of the OAS, as she has written, was merely its standard bearer son porte uh, uh, étendard, where Salon took credit, responsibility for the Operation Ponctuelle, or assassinations carried out by OAS between 1961 and 1962, he was not directly involved in such executions. Along these lines, it is pertinent to mention the stormy, houleuse confrontation between Jacques Achal, former prefect who broke ranks and became an OAS gunman, and Salon. What provoked the bitter exchange of words was the killing of a certain William Levi, left, a left-wing labor leader gunned down by one of Achal's men in Babel Wed, and a Salon's decision to send 500,000 francs to the slain labor leader's widow. According to Achal, and I quote, quoting his words, finally William Levi was shot and killed in Babel Wed. I was severely reprimanded by my man, small fry, many frightin, who told me, why didn't you tell us it was that William Levi? The William Levi we were after lived in Babelwood. One day one of my men saw him. 
uh, in the street. He had known him for 20 years. Levi had been shopping. He was carrying a loaf of bread in one hand and a and his shopping bag, cabasset, in the other. He had several items uh, in the bag, including a litre de rouge. Our man recognized him and shot him. Later, it caused a real melodrama at the level of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the OAS. But you have to put, put yourself in the context of the times. There was little communication between various cells. It was like pointillism. Later I heard that Jean-Jacques Cusini had condemned the killing of uh, uh, Levi in the strongest terms. He called it an enormous mistake. Bavu, my men asked me, what are we doing here? They asked us to, uh, they ask us to kill people and then they call us assassins. It's not possible. I told them that it was just bar talk and to let it, let it drop. Several days later, I went up to see Salon myself. I had, again, I had heard that General Salon had sent 500,000 francs, about $1,000 to Levi's widow. I defended my men and told Salon, we're going to stop. We're through because some of my men are in jail. Others are being shot at by the Garde Mobile. And now you were sending 500,000 francs to Levi's widow? I put my Colt revolver on the table and told him I was through. I said, my men are, being, are beginning to question my orders and I may as well get out. But Sanan was completely in the dark. He hadn't known a thing about the order being handed down because 50 or so similar orders were transmitted every day. I hope, therefore, that the erudite Miss Deacon is aware that she erred in characterizing the late General Salon as a co-founder of the OAS. Even before the lights began to go out, began to dim at the Forum in Algiers on that April night, 1961, the self-defense group known as the Organisation Army Secrète had already begun to take shape. In an interview with another former OAS gunman in his apartment in Paris in 1995, Jean-Marcel Zagané, founder of the Croix Celtique in Algiers in years past, remarked that at the first rassemblement, a meeting of OAS recruits after the putsch, he thought that they all should have been wearing uniforms. Observe that you included my first book, Challenge de Gaulle, in your bibliography. But given the scope and profundity of my field research, I believe that I deserve more recognition. It would not be a modest acclaim that uh, of, of all those who have written about the OAS, I am by far the greatest authority in the subject simply because I took the time and made the effort to track down every former gunman and spook involved in the conflict and still around after 1962. Thus, you should have devoted more space in your book to my contribution to historiography on the Algerian OAS. Thus, if you decide to, to put out, write a second edition of your book, include, if you please, more quotes from Alexander Harrison's work on the subject. An omission that I also found inexcusable was your failure or reluctance to mention the words of Edward Tannenbaum, late tenured professor at New York University who is the uh, author of perhaps one of the best books in Italian fascist experience. I knew him personally and have perused his books, not only on that system of ideas in Italy, but also his works on Charmarasa and his movement Action Francaise. What distinguishes Tannenbaum from the run-of-the-mill tenured professor was his talent as a writer. He was as talented, gifted as a romancier as he was a, as a historian. If you read Tannenbaum, you're a fan for life, a fan forever. In any case, please take my suggestions. Since many of the actors whom I interviewed were veterans of a light infantry parachute regiment, I wanted to find out personally what it was like to jump from a height of between 2,500 and 3,000 feet in order to experience Mutatis Mutandis, what my interlocutors uh, must have felt. It was thrilling. Regarding the chances that one might take in interviewing my subjects, I recall one 
pastis fill the evening at the home of Almona Silva, an uh, OAS activist. And while being driven home by one of his associates, a fellow para, Edward Slama, uh, also known as Doudou, the French love diminutives, by the way, he stopped in front of my hotel. This was in Toulon, 1979, and it was about 3 a.m. And the street was deserted. The RCP, the Régiment de Chasseurs Parachutistes, unveiled the 38 revolver from the truck, said in a semi whisper, Si jamais tu ne trahissais. Although shocked at first, I dismissed later his actions as folklore, theatrics, which in fact they turned out to be. One more thing. In perusing Miss Deacon's work on the role of the extreme right in the resistance, I was struck by the fact that she appears to have done her research almost entirely on the internet. So, so an occasional interview with a survivor from the, the period in French history that she was focused upon. Yet, uh, when she undertook her research, which I, I am assuming was circa 2012, if not sooner, there were still many alive in France who had a first-hand knowledge of the historical period. I should know, since I interviewed personally uh, many who had lived through uh, that period and then went on to join the OAS. ex vichyites Doriotistes, Monarchists, even for those who have passed away, you, you could have interviewed their kid and kin because they were available and knowledgeable about the extreme right during the occupation. Jean-Jacques Susini, vet à penser of the OAS, as well as Jean-Jacques Perez, who handled renseignement et opération just two examples. Others who survived both the occupation and the end of uh, French Algeria uh, is, for example, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who founded the Front National. As a matter of fact, in 1990, I attended the National Congrès Convention of that party in, in uh, Nice. Jean-Marie Le Pen, those people would have made themselves available to the writer if they had been approached. The late great journalist Jimmy Breslin was once asked how he gained information on Cosa Noza underworld factions, and he replied, Shank's Pony, or in other words, going out, finding the subject, and then gathering his testimony. So this is what I find lacking in the extreme right in the resistance, a reluctance to take, to take chances, to go where other historians uh, would fear to tread in order to gain primary source material. I counted the number of first-hand interviews conducted by Ms. Deacon on the fingers of one hand. When I called William Colby years ago to ask him about, uh, to write a forward to challenge him to go, he dictated the following words to me over the phone, which I carefully noted. Scholarship is often thought to consist of paging through dusty tomes in, in, a, in a quiet library. Mr. Harrison shows how it can be enlivened by interviewing real participants in events who can tell more uh, of their actions, their convictions, and their confusions than any written record can. Alexander Harrison shows us that a failed revolution and a successful revolution can have many similarities despite the differences in their outcomes, but that the outcome often, often determines whether the actors become heroes or villains to history. Congratulations on getting the book published, Ms. Deacon. But in my view, uh, it seldom plays, pays to play it safe in life. When senses in your tome and over-reliance on the internet, on secondary and tertiary sources, the computer and a knowledge of informatique are useful tools, but should have been, might have been, supplemented by interviews with those from the, the, the period that uh, or with their kith and kin, uh, the period on which you are focused. And if you had made that effort, the book would have grabbed me, left me with the conviction that Valerie Deacon has written a book, pas pour faire la bobinette, mais parce que, parce qu'elle s'est engagée à fond pour enquêter sur le rôle l'extrême droite dans la résistance.